Hi everyone, I'm Jan van den Herwegen um, and today I will present our paper Fill Your Boots Enhanced Embedded Bootloader Exploits via Fault Injection and Binary Analysis um, done together with David Oswald, Flavio Garcia and Kai Stemeza from the University of Birmingham. So, um, first of all I'm going to introduce uh, the realm of embedded bootloaders and firmware. Um, motivate our research and also give a bit of introduction regarding false injection techniques. Uh, and then finally I'm going to introduce uh, our three targets that we've chosen for this research. Then in the following uh, three sections I'm going to exp I'm going to explain how uh, we exploited each target and then finally I'm going to um, explain a little more about some bootloader design di directives which we call anti-patterns and summarize our research. So first of all, what is an embedded bootloader? The bootloader is um, the first program to execute uh, on a startup or an embedded chip. So as you can see in this diagram, um, typically the bootloader initializes some peripherals um, and then checks some system registers or external pins to see whether it should um, go further into the bootloader or just load the application software. At some point there's also a CRP or code readout protection check um, which typically um, tells whether the chip is uh, reprotected or not and we'll explain more about this later. Um, so a bootloader is quite a critical piece of software since it exposes uh, read and write functionality so basically if you can bypass any uh, security in it you have access, full access to the chip's memory and then finally which is quite important for our research um, it is addressable or readable from a normal user application so a data sheet that would like look like this where you typically have um, a certain area memory reserved for the boot run so the reason uh, we were interested in this <coughs> is because we can um, we can actually read out this bootloader firmware, let's say, and analyze it, and thus make our attacks more effective uh, based on this binary. Um, so the readout protection, which I mentioned earlier, is a mechanism for uh, protecting the memory on the chip. This can be done either in hardware, so through fuses, for example, to disable a debug interface, or um, is also typically done in a special flash page um, which then contains a certain value which indicates whether the read protection is um, enabled or disabled. This can also be done in different granularity so it can have a different protection bit for uh, read, write protection, erase, per sector, per block, um, however the chip manufacturer decides to do this. Um, so this is an example of uh, the LPC bootloader binary which is an ARM microcontroller so you can see it reads um, the uh, the readout protection value the CRP value uh, checks it against a static uh, variable CRP1 and then if it's off it jumps further into the bootloader now why is this so important why would we want to extract firmware um, so first of all as previous research has pointed out uh, is that proprietary crypto in an embedded device is a particularly bad idea. So um, in order to find that and scrutinize it, we ob obviously need to have the firmware. So therefore, um, this is a valuable research. Um, it is uh, necessary to find vulnerabilities in chips. We can extract secret data such as immobili immobilizer keys or crypto keys, um, which might be more than just uh, an individual device's key, but actually a manufacturer key, let's say. And then there are a few more reasons, for example, forensics, uh, the repurposing of end of life devices, um, replacement firmware, you name it. So the targets we picked um, vary in difficulty and setup and expectation method. So first of all, the LPC1343 is an ARM-based device, um, which we attack configured on CRP1, uh, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, but basically, um, this is a software-only exploitation, and the difficulty herein lies uh, the development of a 
a rough return oriented programming exploit on such a restricted embedded device and also exploiting um, its memories. Then we have two hardware, uh, two targets we, we attack by hardware. Um, so the STM8 um, locks the bootloader on startup based on the option bytes it's called. Um, so since it's locked on startup, there's a very small uh, critical code base. So, but here, uh, what makes it difficult uh, to attack is the actual glitch parameters. So let's say. For for instance, with voltage glitching, that's the width, the offset, and the glitch voltage. And then finally, we have the Renesas 78K0, which is an 8-bit chip. Um, this restricts the write axis and has no read functionality, um, but always exposes certain commands, such as a checksum or a verify on a longer uh, array of bytes, some 256 bytes, for example. Um, since this is a larger code base that's accessible um, here, uh, the timing is a difficult aspect and not the other glitch parameters. So, false injection techniques um, typically uh, have to weigh up whether uh, the cost and versus the invasiveness. So, first of all, we have uh, voltage glitching, which is what we opted for. It's a very accessible, very cheap. Um, the device we uh, developed is a giant, uh, it's open source hardware and costs about $150 to assemble. Um, then there's also optical um, fault injection, for example UV light could uh, reset certain fuses or erase certain bits um, when exposed, but this requires um, extensive preparation of the targets. Then there's also laser injection, which is extremely expensive, uh, the setup, but can be very accurate. And then finally, there's also a mid-range where uh, electromagnetic pulses can affect the chip's functionality with great uh, available tools, such as the chip shouter, which I definitely would recommend. Now, the first um, target, the LPC-1343. Um, so it has multiple CRP levels which are only enabled uh, by certain value values so CRP1 um, has restricted write access and no read access to the, to the chip CRP2 um, basically limits uh, the functionality to a chip erase on CRP3 the chip is fully locked so there's no programming functionality and then finally it has another level which is called no ISP uh, which only disables the bootloader but still um, has the debug interface, the SWD interface um, enabled. So this chip has al already been uh, attacked by voltage fault in injection by Galinsky et al um, a few years ago but we uh, would like to show how the complexity of the bootloader leads to a software only exploitation. So uh, for that we have to have a brief look at the stack. Um, so on the bottom of the of the RAM of memory, it loads it stores the CRP value. So this is the previous uh, these bytes basically. Then uh, the bootloader resides in RAM. Uh, the stack area uh, is here, which is writable um, and which is what we will exploit. So since the stack area is writable. Um, we can overwrite return addresses on the stack. So if we call the write to RAM command, we can actually write to the stack and overwrite its return address with an address inside the read memory command handler past the, rub, uh, past the CRP check. So we write these values on the check, on the stack basically, which contain the address to be read out. <coughs> and um, the return address first, so um, the program counter pops to the read memory command, which then pops certain values of the check on the, of the stack, uh, which are the addresses to read. And then finally, through several more gadgets, we get back to the command handler and we can repeat this process. Then um, we found one more vulnerability, which is that um, individual sectors on this uh, chip can be erased and rewritten. So that also leads to um, a 
a ma major vulnerability where we can just overwrite a certain sector which we know um, will be execute, executed with a dumper program. So uh, we can bar from this one section and uh, read out the rest of the memory of the chip. Now um, I'll go into the next target, the STM8. Um, so the STM8 security is configured by two option bytes it's called. So the first one is the readout protection or ROP byte, which is depending on which bootloader uh, version it is. We've looked at two either turned on or turned off by programming this byte by up to AA hex. And then finally there's also the bootloader option bytes uh, which determine whether the bootloader will be enabled at all first of all. So in a diagram this looks like this. So if reset the bootloader uh, initializes a few peripherals and disables all interrupts then it checks whether the, the chip is empty or if the uh, bootloader option bytes are set. If that is the case then it checks the ROP bytes so the readout protection. If that's active um, it just uh, goes onto the user application and then if it's not active finally it goes through. So we dumped the bootloader and in the bootloader uh, binary this looks like this. So first of all it calls uh, the check empty sub function, which um, checks the first byte in flash, whether it's AC2 or AC. If that is the case, then the chip is not empty, and if that's not the case, uh, vice versa. So then either it jumps into the uh, check CRP um, basic block, which then checks whether the, um, the readout protection byte is set or cleared. So basically, looking at this binary, um, we know we will require two glitches on a fully secured chip. So the first one would be to get to reach this basic block. So that's either here where we convince the chip that, the, that it's empty or either here where we convince it that the, um, the bootloader option byte is set. Um, through experiments, this uh, basic block um, turned out to be the easiest to glitch. So the first glitch is inserted here, which gets us to this basic block, and then finally we just have to um, skip this jump and go to the serial bootloader, which then exposes uh, all the functionality. So um, doing that, we knew that there was two critical sections, and um, on a profiling device, we can actually code these sections or program these sections into a user application where we completely take away the timing aspects of a glitch. So we pull a GPIO pin high, then we have our critical section which we want to glitch. So there's only like one or two microseconds there where the glitch can fall. And then finally we pull uh, another GPIO pin high to indicate success. So here this uh, figure gives an idea of which um, glitch voltages work with with which glitch widths. Um, so there's only um, a relatively small uh, subset of voltages and and widths which work with each other. So, but here we have more of an idea of these glitch parameters. Then the second step is to get the attack the wheel bootloader. So first of all, we can do this on a profiling device again, where we um, either enable the readout protection or the bootloader bytes. So we always, we in either option, we only need one glitch. And then finally, we do the full double glitch attack on the real target, wh where we have to focus on the timing, uh, since we already know the uh, voltages mm. and widths from the previous, from the first step. So what can help with this is also uh, a boot power consumption graph, um, which we obtain by connecting a shunt resistor to the ground. And then we can see the power consumption. So the bootloader starts about here. Um, then there's a section of about 20 or 15 microseconds uh, where it executes. And then we know where the first glitch needs to fall and the second glitch. And then finally, we can see that the user is high. So this can actually um, 
make the window, the glitch window, a lot smaller if you have a, uh, a power consumption, an idea of the power consumption of the chip. Then finally, um, I'll explain how we uh, enhanced uh, voltage glitching by static analysis on the Renesas 78K0 um, chip. So, um, Bonsato et al. Uh, came up with a very clever attack on this chip, basically. Um, so, the chip only locks right axis, but um, leaves the, a, long, a checksum and a verify. Uh, open basically, but only on um, only on 256 consecutive bytes. So technically, you couldn't um, gain much information from having a checksum done on 256 bytes. However, um, they found that by voltage glitching, they could get this down to four bytes, and they could also leak individual bytes by glitching during the checksum calculation. Um, so we decided to look into the bootloader binary and actually try to predict uh, glitch offsets based on which addresses we're generating the checksum or verify uh, from. So we noticed that each um, command in the bootloader had this uh, sort of sanity check um, subroutine, which basically, if given two addresses, it checked uh, which block number it was, whether the block numbers uh, corresponded, if uh, the lower address was lower than um, than the maximum maximum allowed uh, address, and whether the both addresses are whether the first ad address is higher than the second. So since the same function is uh, executed for all these bootloader commands, and um, depending on where it fails or succeeds. Um, it returns, this will affect the glitch offsets. So the idea is to statically predict these offsets by um, putting the arguments or the two addresses given to the checksum and verify command to, um, into equivalence classes, uh, which is what they're, they're called. So basically the idea is that given a certain function, for example this one, um, certain sets of arguments will always take the same path through this function based on the constraints generated. So this is akin to um, symbolic execution where we taint the inputs to, uh, to a function from starting from uh, the interrupt handler, handler to where the bootloader responds. We taint these input arguments and then we build up the constraints. And then based on these constraints um, we generate our equivalence classes with all arguments which have the same constraints and thus the same execution path through uh, the bootloader binary. Um, then what does this look like actually glitching? So um, we were actually able to, um, based on the first successful offset, for example of this um, equivalence class, we were able to predict how um, how much further in time or how much bigger the offset should be for other equivalence classes based on the um, length of the execution path. So how many more clock ticks and then based on the uh, frequency of the device um, we could predict where the other offsets, all the, of all the other equivalence classes uh, should fall. So that's uh, how we use leverage static analysis for voltage glitching. Um, while well, completely uh, ignoring the other glitch uh, parameters such as voltage and uh, width, we set the voltage to zero and the width to 100 nanoseconds, so just constant. Finally, um, I will summarize uh, some bootloader design directives which, uh, if they're followed, uh, they might be able to mitigate issues like this. So there's a few anti-patterns we've noticed, which um, are basically to be avoided in any um, bootloader design. So uh, the first one, partial RAM right axis, led to the LPC microcontroller, where we could where we could overwrite the uh, return address on the stack. Then uh, similar for the next one, where we could uh, erase and overwrite a certain flash sector. Um, to then with dumper code which then dumps the whole chip 
um, certain chips default to unprotected, which can make it a lot easier to glitch when um, there's, for example, 15 values which disable the readout protection and only one that enables it. Um, a non-redundant CRP check makes it easier to glitch, so that um, if there's only one, then you only need one glitch, for example. A um, large number of protection levels may confuse developers as to what's actually protected, what's actually not. Um, is write access complete write access to the chip or only to RAM, etc. Um, complex bootloader logic could lead to uh, software only vulnerabilities, such as we've seen in the LPC. And then finally, the non atomic erase. Um, is also if you can erase one sector and then somehow overwrite it, then the rest of the firmware is also vulnerable. So I thank you for listening, and if there's any questions, um, please do ask me on the presentation at chess. Thank you very much.